If you're anything like me, you can see the writing on the wall. It's clear that the government is in between a rock and a hard place. Between the government's debt at over $32 trillion, their spending, which is currently at $5.3 trillion this year alone, which is up 10% from last year, the declining revenues, which are down 10% this year, only at $3.6 trillion, nowhere near enough to fund the spending, resulting in growing deficits this year up 122%. And on top of that, interest rates on government borrowing getting ready to skyrocket to levels it hasn't seen in decades. It's clear the government is set up for a sovereign debt crisis. It's also clear that the only way the government avoids default for the long term is to fire up the money printer again. And once the public catches on to this, it's clear that all the wealth will flow into assets or into places that will protect them from this currency debasement. Now that seems fine on the surface, but then you realize the problem is then the government isn't actually able to confiscate all the wealth they need to save themselves from their financial situation. If all all the wealth flees and protects itself from inflation, the government can't seize any of that wealth. And that's when capital controls start. Financial repression sets in. It's an old playbook that has been used many times in many places. And for years, the US and other countries around the world have been gearing up to do the exact same thing again. If you don't know who I am, my name is Joe Brown. I run Heresy Financial University, where I teach active investors how to make more and lose less by understanding how markets actually work. If you're interested in learning more, link in the description below. So what's the situation? First, we have to look at the debt and the debt to GDP ratio. Currently, the government has a pile of $32.7 trillion in debt. This chart shows the United States debt broken down by the maturity, which shows that all Almost half of U.S. debt will mature within the next two years. Considering the fact that interest rates are much higher than they were for the last 10 years or so, this means that as this debt gets paid off and they borrow new debt to pay off the old debt, their interest expense is going to go through the roof. Economists have researched many different nations, many different economies throughout different cultures, different government styles, and throughout history, and they found that it's very hard for a nation to come back from exceeding a 90% debt to GDP ratio, meaning the value of the economy is the GDP. And if the government owes more than 90% of that value in debt, that's basically a point of no return. Now, some argue about the 90% number and say, well, the real number is 120%. And there are even more economists who agree that that 120% is almost impossible to come back from. Very simply, it just means that you've gotten yourself into a point where you owe too much that you aren't able to tax your way out of it. You just have to keep on borrowing yourself into an endless spending loop. The United States, though, has gotten to 120% before and gotten out of it in World War II when we peaked out at 121% debt to GDP. But the reason why that situation doesn't really apply to today is because the spending that got us there could stop as soon as the war ended. Today, the spending that the United States has is full of things that are legal obligations and political suicide to stop spending money on. Things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and above all, the military. Seeing as how today we are still in that 120% debt to GDP range, with spending nowhere near slowing down and borrowing speeding up, it does seem like we have passed the point of no return, especially because tax revenue is falling. It is down 10% just from last year to this year at only $3.6 trillion. And this is during a recovery. And most people expect that when you enter into a recession or some sort of economic decline, that taxes are going to decrease. People get laid off, so there's less income tax. Asset prices fall, and so there's less capital gains tax. There's less economic activity, which means there's less corporate tax. And overall, people decide to save and buckle down for the hard time, so there's less spending, which means less sales tax. Pretty much every angle you look at it, you're going to have 
fewer dollar transactions, which means less money going to the government. But first, a word from today's sponsor, I Trust Capital. Investors today face all sorts of new and unique risks. Invest in stocks and risky stock market crash. Invest in bonds and watch the value of those bonds drop as interest rates rise. Keep your money in cash and watch inflation eat away your purchasing power. Invest in crypto and watch frauds like Sam Bankman Freed steal all your money. This has many investors looking to alternative stores of value like gold and Bitcoin. The problem with this is that most investors are not able to access gold and Bitcoin. This is because most people have most of their assets tied up in their retirement accounts. And most retirement accounts do not allow you access to things like gold or silver or Bitcoin. This is where iTrust Capital comes in. iTrust Capital allows you to open up a new retirement account or even transfer an existing retirement account. Then you can purchase alternative stores of value with your retirement like gold, silver, and Bitcoin. In days like this where fraudulent platforms like FTX are collapsing and traditional banks like Silicon Valley Bank are failing from bank runs. I trust capital is still going strong because they do things the right way. You own your assets there. Your assets are always held off balance sheet and your accounts are never commingled with theirs. They partner with industry leaders like Kitco for their precious metals. They're straightforward about how they keep your assets separate and safe. And if you use my my link in the description below, you will get $100 worth of Bitcoin just for signing up. And that's less than right now, which is already on the decline, and it's nowhere near the amount the US government is currently spending. Now, spending by the government also normally increases during recessions because they're trying to help stimulate the economy, bring it out of the recession, stimulate spending. So the government takes on that role since individuals and corporations are doing the right thing and spending less money. The government steps in and says, no, we need more spending to happen. So the government causes misallocation of resources and malinvestment by trying to spend more and more money and force economic activity to happen. So the setup in front of us is that spending can only go up for a number of reasons. The revenue that they're taking from taxes is only gonna go down for a number of reasons, which means the borrowing that they're gonna do is gonna go up even faster for a number of reasons. And because of the interest rate environment that we are in, that means that the government borrowing will be more and more expensive. And because that borrowing is so expensive, they'll have to borrow even more to pay for that more expensive borrowing. So the question is why are interest rates high and could they move back down? And the answer is inflation. The consumer price index peaked in June of 2022 at 9.5 percent and since has been on the decline. Now, I've been very vocal about the fact that I think this will continue down and short term, we will probably even see negative inflation or in other words, deflation. But the money printing that happened in 2020 and 2021 was only one cause of the inflation. There are many more sources of fuel and all they need is a spark to reignite inflation yet again. And I do think we absolutely will see a catalyst that will trigger inflation to start moving higher once again. And the Federal Reserve is actually aware of this. And they've said many times in the last year or so that they don't want to stop raising rates too early and let inflation reignite again like it did during the 70s. They would rather tighten for too long, too much to make sure that they've stopped inflation. This puts the federal government in a very tough spot because as the government has to continue to borrow more and more to pay for its higher and higher expenses while it's taking less and less in taxes, that means that its expenses will very soon get to a point where it just can't afford to borrow at these high rates. But because of all the pressures on inflation, the Federal Reserve can't just lower interest rates to help out the U.S. government. They are legally obligated by Congress to care about two things only, maximum employment and stable prices. But you heard that right. They are obligated by the US government to care about those two things, which means that when push comes to shove, as the government gets in between this rock and this hard place, all they have to do is give the Fed a new mandate. Rewrite the Federal Reserve Act, which has already been rewritten. That dual mandate started in the 70s. The original Federal Reserve Act was written in 1913, and that established the Federal Reserve. But the Federal Reserve Act of 1977 is what what gave the Federal Reserve the dual mandate, maximum employment and stable prices. So you can bet your last dollar that if the government is facing default and the Federal Reserve is not lowering rates because they have to care about inflation, that the government 
Congress will simply rewrite a new Federal Reserve Act, melding the federal government and the Federal Reserve, the central bank, the central government, turning the Fed into the printer, the financer for the US government. And it really is a choice between these two options. It is on one hand, you save the dollar and sacrifice the government, or you save the government and sacrifice the dollar. Now, if they do make the choice to save the purchasing power of the dollar and not risk hyperinflation and sacrifice the government's ability to borrow and tax and force them to default and restructure their debt, this will absolutely be a big problem for the US economy short term. However, this will destroy, it will remove a very large tumor off the back of the American economy. And that tumor, US government, will no longer be able to confiscate resources and wealth and capital away from the economy. And it will set a new foundation that will allow the US economy to thrive long term going forward. On the other hand, if they do choose to go the route of saving the US government from default and sacrificing the dollar instead, the purchasing power of the dollar, lowering rates for the US government, allowing them to borrow anything they want from the Federal Reserve at rates much lower than the inflation rate, essentially just printing the money they need for their expenses, causing inflation for everybody else. This will be short term beneficial for the economy like we saw in 2020 and 2021. There will be an artificial boom because you're going to have a new flood of money enter the economy. Prices are going to start getting bid up everywhere prices of assets, prices of businesses, prices of goods and services, and prices of wages, and people are gonna feel rich because of the false wealth effect from an increase in the money supply. Ultimately, at the end of the day though, this all causes a misallocation of resources and malinvestments. People who don't understand the difference between money and wealth don't realize that all this malinvestment, misallocation of resources is actually destroying wealth, regardless of the fact that prices are going up. This is why you see such scarcity in places that experience hyperinflation, like the Weimar Republic in Germany, like Zimbabwe, like Argentina, like Lebanon, like Turkey, like Venezuela, every time you have hyperinflation, you get extreme scarcity and economic poverty, regardless of the fact that prices go up. The real pool of wealth is destroyed. And every time investors see this coming, they realize we need to get our wealth out of here. Whether that is buying certain assets that are inflation protected or actually moving your wealth out of that geographical location, you always see a flight of wealth be attempted at this stage. As soon as that switch flips, when the central bank starts monetizing the government's debt, you know hyperinflation is only a matter of time, not a question of if. And that's when capital flight begins. And nine times out of 10, the central government realizes they won't be able to go through with their scheme if all the wealth leaves. And so they enter into capital controls and financial repression to prevent this wealth from protecting itself by leaving. There's even precedence for this in the United States when FDR signed Executive Order 6102, which outlawed gold ownership for US citizens. You see, FDR knew that he was going to spend a bunch more dollars that they didn't have. So he needed a way to print more dollars without United States citizens being able to protect their wealth. So step one was take all the gold away from American citizens. Step two then was to declare the value of that gold much higher, which gave them the ability to issue more paper, which was backed up by that gold. In this way, US investors were prevented from protecting their wealth in gold and were forced to see their wealth devalued and confiscated as it was transferred to the government. This is a very similar dynamic that happened in 2020 and 2021 when the US printed a bunch more paper, spent it all at the original prices. When that money moved its way through the economy, prices went up. That was a giant wealth transfer from American citizens to the US government. By the way, guys, I'm doing a silver giveaway, hundreds of dollars worth of silver for the Silver Symposium in Vegas from September 29th through October 1st. First place prize is getting this 10 ounce silver round. It's an Australian kookaburra, beautiful 10 ounce piece here. Second place gets this 10 ounce bar, not as pretty, but it's still 10 ounces of silver, so hundreds of dollars here. Third place prize gets this one ounce silver round. It's plated with gold and it has this nice little Bitcoin design stamped into it, so pretty cool. So what do you have to do to get the prizes? Number one, you have to sign up for the event with the ticket link in the description below. Number two, you have to meet me in person. The first person who signed up with my link who meets me there in Vegas gets this first place prize. Second person to meet me gets the second place prize. Third person there to meet me gets the third place prize. So get your ticket 
tickets in the link below. Just a couple of weeks left. Can't wait to see you there and give away these, uh, these silver prizes. Another example of financial repression is an exit tax, which California's proposed exit tax is an example of. Essentially, the government telling citizens, hey, you can stay here and we'll continue to take money from you, but if you decide to leave, well, we'll take it from you anyway. Another very common example of financial repression is outlawing ownership and or purchasing of other currencies. Right now, in many places around the world that are experiencing inflation or hyperinflation, the people would rather use things like US dollars because it is a better currency than theirs is. This right here is a Lebanese pound that my friend who lives in Lebanon gave me. It is 100,000 Lebanese pounds. Uh, just a couple of years ago, this was worth, I believe, if I remember correctly, like seven US dollars. Today, it's worth like 10 cents, barely even worth the paper it's printed on. Desperate governments do all sorts of things to try and stop that wealth from fleeing and trying to capture and transfer that purchasing power to themselves in any way possible. Obviously, a central bank digital currency would make all of this much easier. If everybody is already using a digital currency run by the central bank, it would be very easy for the central bank to simply deposit more currency units into the government's account, debit it, currency units out of individuals' accounts, place rations on things that are experiencing price spikes, or put temporary blocks in place from you being able to spend money at certain places, regardless of how much you want to spend. I've mentioned a few times already, but this is not anything new. This is a very old playbook that has been used many times, many countries, many different government styles throughout history whenever the government gets into a bad spot. As recently as 2015, the IMF was writing a working paper on the liquidation of government debt, finding that through financial repression, which is a tax on bondholders and savers, through negative interest rates or below market interest rates, that government debt can be reduced. And it is most successful when it is accompanied by inflation. Essentially, as long as your wealth doesn't have a backdoor to escape the system, the US government can impose negative interest rates during inflation and transfer all that purchasing power of your wealth to themselves. And don't worry, just in case you think they've forgotten about it since 2015, as recently as 2023, they are making more progress on capital controls during times of crisis stating that a key finding is that if a country has pervasive controls before the start of the crisis, they are shielded, they are better off than countries with more open capital accounts. Countries with more open capital accounts see a significant decline in capital flows during crises. Essentially, the IMF is warning governments around the world, if you think that you are going to be facing a debt restructuring issue, if you think you're gonna have a sovereign debt crisis, if you think you won't be able to afford to pay the bills, it's better to get those capital controls in place now because if you try and reintroduce them or introduce them for the first time later, once the crisis starts, people will already have a way out. You've gotta get your people used to having no way out and being stuck in the system now before the crisis hits. So I don't know if this needs to be said, but buy assets outside of the system now while you still can, because if you wait until you need to, you probably won't be able to. You've got to have gold in other countries. You've got to own Bitcoin outside of something like a Bitcoin trust or an ETF, something that's inside the system. You've got to have wealth outside the system so that if they impose something on your bank account that has been flipped over and is suddenly part of a central bank digital currency without any opt-in or without any consent on your part, and they can suddenly control the transactions that happen, money going in and out of all of your accounts. By that moment, you already have to have some wealth outside that system. Otherwise, it'll be too late. For more information on protecting and growing your wealth, consider joining Heresy Financial University, linked in the description below. As always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.